This is Dr. R. Winston Mazakis. I welcome you to our page on YouTube. And I hope and pray that this study will be a blessing to your life. After you have listened to this message, and if you'd like to listen now or later to more studies, go to YouTube at any time. Put my name, Winston Mazakis, W-I-N-S-T-O-N, Mazakis, M-A-Z-A-K-I-S, on the YouTube search line and click on Find. Once you are on our page, you can choose the study you would like to hear in English, Arabic, or French. And if you are interested in studying the Bible by correspondence, free of charge, please contact the website that you see on this screen. And if you would like to study the Bible scholarly to earn a graduate of theology degree or a doctor of theology degree, please go to memjohn, that's one word, memjohn.com, in order to know about the Institute of Biblical and International Studies where you will master the greatest subjects at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time. And I assure you, you will never regret taking this course. I know it will be a great blessing to you. And I assure you, you will never find a better place to study the Bible in depth, like at the Institute of Biblical and International Studies. This is Tape 523, The Roman Empire in Prophecy. Daniel Chapter 2 we spoke in the last few meetings about the first three empires that the Bible spoke about in that chapter. Today, we come to the fourth empire in verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, parts of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with mighty clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with mighty clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not adhere one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. May the Lord add his blessing upon the reading of his word. Now we come to the fourth kingdom. Remember here that King Nebuchadnezzar saw a great statue, a great image standing before him in his dream. The head was of gold, the breast and the arms of silver, the hips and the thighs were of bronze, and the legs were of iron, and the toes were partly of iron and part of clay. If you thought yesterday, those who were here, thought it was fascinating to see the prophecies of the Word of God concerning three main empires that emerged on earth, and how these prophecies were fulfilled exactly as they were prophesied in the Bible. They were fulfilled in the course of history exactly as they were prophesied. Tonight we are going to see something more fascinating. When we studied about the three kingdoms, we saw that the things we studied, the prophecies that were fulfilled, were prophecies that should be called the Incredibles. Because indeed, they were pre-recorded history, history that was recorded in advance. But the difference between history recorded in advance and history recorded later is that the historian waits and waits till the event is already accomplished and done and then even then he doesn't even have all the facts. But the prophecy, the pre-recorded history, which we call prophecy, it doesn't only tell you about the event as such, it tells you about the causes and the ramifications and the results that, and he doesn't even wait till these things happen. He tells you these things hundreds, and in some instances, like in the fourth kingdom, as we are going to see thousands of years before these things came to pass. That shows you one thing, that man had nothing to do with these things. The prophecy is not the words of a man. 
This is why the prophets say, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Daniel made it very clear in his testimony, As for me, Daniel, these things were not revealed unto me, because I was wiser than any of the living, but that thou mayest know that God, God, God ruleth in the kingdom of men. That's a beautiful testimony. And in this prophecy about the fourth kingdom, God allowed Daniel to record many things about that kingdom. This is why I said we will not be able in this very mini-series to discuss all of it, because it takes hours. Fantastic study. As a matter of fact, in order to study it, we have to go through Revelation, through Thessalonians, and many other places which we would not have the time in this particular series to discuss. However, I would like to point your attention something about the first three kingdoms to compare it with the fourth kingdom so you would understand what I will be talking about in the next few minutes. In verse 12 of chapter 7 of Daniel, he said, and for the rest of the beasts, that is the first three, uh, he's speaking here about the beasts of the three empires, the lion in verse 4, the bear in verse 5, and the leopard in verse 6, these representing the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Grecian Empire respectively. But he never gives us the name of the fourth beast in verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, strong exceedingly, doesn't know what it is. It's a different kind of beast. Now what kind of a different kind of beast? Let me show you what kind. In verse 12 it says, And the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season as time. In other words, here the Bible is telling us, these nations, the first name Babylonia, Persia, and Greece, even though they would exist for a time after they were great empires that ruled the world, they won't banish just like that. Babylonia stayed for a long time after it was dethroned as a world empire. Persia, we still have Persia. It's staying there at the time. Iran is Persia. But it's not a world kingdom anymore. The Bible is telling us that. And it will never become again a world empire. Even though Khomeini would like to, doesn't he? With his Islamic revolution and Islamic march into the Middle East, or trial to march into the Middle East, trying to revive the Persian Empire under the banner of, of, of Islam today. But the Bible said he will never succeed. A small nation called Iraq had stopped him. Last summer they killed 50,000 men out of, from his army. Just a little country called Iraq. Mind you, Iran, which is purchased 27 million people, and Iraq is about 9 million. One third the population of Iran, and they stopped the invasion of the Iranian armies. Iran will never, never rise again as a world empire or a world power especially Iran. The Bible said it would never rise again as a world empire. Not even Greece. It's still there, but not as a world empire no more. It will never be a world empire. But listen what the Bible says about the fourth kingdom. And this I saw in the night vision, verse 7, And behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had a great iron teeth, it devoured and broke to pieces and stamped the residue with its feet and it was different from all the other beasts that were before it and it had ten horns that is most fascinating most fascinating now we are going to study why it was different from the other beasts did you notice in verse 12 what the Bible said that the first three beasts rose to world power then they subsided they fell never to rise again 
to world power. Why? Because the Bible said after the fourth beast destroy the first three beasts and that happened in 64 BC. In 64 BC Rome marched eastward and destroyed Greece, destroyed Persia, destroyed everything else. Took Egypt, took Turkey, took the Near East, took North Africa and no one could stand before it. The difference between Rome and the rest of the empires is tremendous. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 2, and you have to understand that very thoroughly in order to understand what is the difference between the Roman Empire and the rest of the beast. He said about the Roman Empire, in the days of these kings, verse 44, chapter 2 of Daniel shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed in the days of the kings of Rome God will set his kingdom by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross of Calvary and start the kingdom of God and he said that kingdom will grow and grow and grow until finally that kingdom at the millennium which is inaugurated by the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ shall destroy the world system that would prevail at that time and the Bible calls it Rome the Roman Empire listen what the Bible says in the days of the fourth kingdom when does the fourth kingdom start? when it destroys the third kingdom the Grecian Empire and that started in 64 BC the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broken pieces the iron the bronze the clay the silver and the gold the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain and the interpretation of it is sure now this is you have to understand that the Bible said that in the days of these kings the kings of the fourth empire God will set up his kingdom as a little stone. That little stone would grow up still, the Bible said, during the reign of those kings and becomes a big stone, like a mountain. A mountain in the Bible is a kingdom, the kingdom of God at the millennium that would rule the whole earth and crush what? The fourth empire starting from the toes. We are going to see what are the toes in this Bible now. That's fascinating for us to see that God allowed us to understand now that the fourth kingdom will never, never, never be abolished from the face of the earth until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, but who was the first one to prophesy about the Roman Empire? Now, that's very, very interesting. If you would open with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 64. 28 and verse 64. You will see there something fascinating. In verse 49, let me read the 49. It says, And the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Now here in this chapter, if you read this chapter, you would read something very interesting. You would read that in the first part of this chapter, he speaks about the captivity. That the first time you anger God, God will pluck you out of your nation, and he will take you into another land, and you will be captives there. See how accurate the Bible is? And we know that happened when the Babylonian captivity took place and Nebuchadnezzar took the Israelis into captivity. 
But he said the second time, verse 49, the Lord shall bring you a nation from far, from the end of the earth. Look at the end of the earth. That was the map that was known in those days. See that? What's the end of the earth? Right here. This was the end of the earth at that time. That's all what they know from the map. They wouldn't dare go any beyond that. Oh, another thing. Look, look at that. In verse 49. See, Moses gave his prophecy in about 1500 B.C. And the Romans came in, in 64 B.C. That is, about 1500 years before the Romans came, the Lord told them what's going to happen to them when the Romans come. That is most fascinating. Listen to that. Let me read that verse again. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. Did you notice the, the Bible mentioned even the eagle? As a matter of fact, as the, the hoofs of the horses start to get heard with the marching of the bands and the armies coming close to a town, the first thing you would see as the Roman army is approaching, the first thing you see, you know what? The eagle. On the flapping Roman flags. And here the Bible is telling us that the Romans coming with the eagles. And look, look, look what the Bible said that making sure that he's speaking about the Romans. Listen what the Bible said that that nation would do to Israel in verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. What? Here the Bible said that under that nation, from verse 49 on, that's he's talking about the Roman Empire and what's going to happen to the Israelis under the Romans. He said, under that nation, what happens? He said, you will be scattered all over the world. Thus, fulfilling the prophecy of Moses and the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ that backed the prophecy of Moses. See, we just read the prophecy of Moses that and the Jews shall be led away captives. And what did the Lord Jesus Christ say? In Luke, Luke chapter 21, verse 24. And the Jews shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captives into all nations. Did you notice that? The same prophecy of Moses. But what did the Lord Jesus Christ say to them? That upon you may fall all the righteous blood that was shed upon the earth. From the blood of the righteous Abel, and to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you stood between the temple and the altar. Verily, verily, I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. And we see that that generation saw the fulfillment of the prophecy of Moses, the prophecy of Jeremiah, the prophecy of Daniel, backed by the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, this generation will see. And what happened? That generation saw the destruction of Jerusalem and the solding of the Jews all over the world. Now, what is the fourth kingdom? The Roman Empire. They came from Rome and they swept the Mediterranean and they made the Mediterranean as the Roman lake. The main function of the Roman Empire since its inception was two things. To destroy the people of the Most High and to wear out, the Bible says in chapter 8 and chapter 7 of Daniel, the saints of the Most High. Declare a war against the saints of the Most High. The people of the Most High were the Jews. Now we know that even in the days of Claudius Caesar, Rome set its face against the Jews. That's why Paul the Apostle could meet Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila. Why? Because these were, a man and husband, were merchants in the city of Rome. But Claudius Caesar didn't like the Jews very much. So he kicked them out. All the Jews were kicked out from the city of Rome. And they sent to other cities. So as Aquila and Priscilla went to Greece, where they met Brother Paul. He met with them because they were already thrown out from the city of Rome. There were Romans. The Bible said so. And uh, the emperor of Rome, Claudius Caesar, didn't like the Jews. And he forbade the Jews from living in Rome. He kicked them out. So the persecution against the Jews started in the days of Claudius Caesar, while Paul the apostle was still alive. Then we know that in 70th AD, when the Jews revolted against the Roman Empire, Rome sent Vespasian, 
the general to destroy the Jews and he almost destroyed about two to three million Jews in about less than one year. Now when he received the letter to come back to Rome because the Senate chose him as the new emperor, he left his son Titus who finished the job by killing every other Jew that was in his way, destroying every town in his way until he came to Jerusalem, destroyed Jerusalem, crucified young people by the dozens around the city of Jerusalem and sold the rest in the Roman slavery markets. Anytime you study the history of the Roman Empire, you always study their history with violence against the Jews, as we are going to see in our few minutes of resume. The second main function was trying to destroy the Church of Jesus Christ throughout its history. We have to understand that. We know that in 64 AD, Nero wanted to start a new city. The reason was, his palace was right smack in the middle of the city, right next to the marketplace. And the marketplace in the summertime is the gathering center of farmers. Every farmer has a pig, has a cow, has a sheep, brings it to the middle of the town to sell it. But in July and August, you bring all these cows, the sheep, especially the pigs, the hogs, very muggy. <laughs> it smells awful. He couldn't bear the smell no more. He had to plug his nose throughout July and August. Couldn't take it no more. He said, I, I have an idea. Why don't I burn Rome? So this way I can build a new Rome and build the market way far at the other end of Rome so I won't have to smell the pigs and hogs and the cows and their manures. Especially on a muggy day. Because when you are on the Mediterranean in August and July, it's very muggy. It's unbearable. To add to it the smell of the manure, that is too much for an emperor. So he burned down Rome. He burned it down without consulting his senate and people that were of great value for counsel. He just sent his men and burned down Rome just like that. When the people found out that their homes are on fire, they wanted blood, revenge. He got scared. So all these multitudes, waves and waves of multitudes coming against him. Now he said, what are we going to do? I can't face all these people just like that. I can't tell them that I burned their home and, and their belongings and their city. We've got to do something. Some wise guy came up with the idea. All right, we don't have to tell them you did it. Those crazy Christians have been telling that the world is going to be burnt by fire for a long time. Let's tell them they did it so they could prove a point. See? So they told the people, those Christians did it. They've been preaching to you for a long period of time that the God is going to burn this world with fire. And now they sneakily burn down Rome to tell us that the end of the world is here. Okay, lynch those Christians. They start catching them, burning them, crucifying them, throwing through the dens of lions. What a lie. And the persecution continued from then on and started to intensify, especially in the days of what we call the five pious emperors. I don't know why they call them pious. They don't know even what the name of piety was. Like Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius, Trojan. These were pious emperors, they say. But these are the ones that killed in their piety the Christians in the name of their piety until the Cletian came. That was the top of the cream. He set himself as God and put an image of his own in every town and village and asked everyone to worship it. And he gave a strict order that everyone in the palace should refer to him and call him by the name Dominus Deus, the Lord God. And anyone that would not worship his own image should be destroyed. His property should be confiscated. And he gave strict orders that every copy of the Bible should be burnt down. And anyone that would not do that is liable to be burnt down himself or killed or crucified. You know, after that, launching a tremendous war like the Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 11, and chapter 10, that... Rome and that fourth kingdom is going to launch a tremendous war against the saints of the Most High and they will prevail.
They did. One day, Diocletian stood up in front of thousands and thousands of people in that great Colosseum of Rome, and he said to them with great pride, Today I can declare that I abolished the religion of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The people cheered, clapped, threw dust in the air, screamed their hallelujahs for the destruction of the religion of Jesus Christ. In them was embodied that great, great Psalm 2 which says, Why the nations are raging? Why the people of earth are plotting against God and against His Messiah, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Why? He came in righteousness. He came to save their souls, to give them everlasting life. Why? Why? It was too bad for Diocletian. He never knew what happened to him. How mistaken he was when he thought that he destroyed the religion of Jesus Christ. Because not long after that, Diocletian abdicated his throne and he lived in an area where Croatia is as, and guess what? came way down in the status of humanity, from being Dominus Deus to being a seller of cabbage. And the religion of Jesus Christ was declared the religion of the state in Rome, fortunately or unfortunately, but that was the case. Jesus made an unconditional promise for his church. He said, I build my church and not even the gates of hell shall prevail over it, let alone the gates of Rome. That's very, very interesting about the Fourth Empire. It never, never was abolished from the face of the earth. Never. First, the system of Rome was in Rome itself. But the system that the Bible said it's different from the others was different in the sense that even though the system would not stay in one place and it moved from one place to another, yet it never died. We know Rome flourished for a long period of time. Then it declined. However, the system flourished for another place in Constantinople for a long period of time. Then when in Constantinople the system started to decline, it came up again, this time in France, under the name of the Holy Roman Empire. Let me give you an example so you will understand what I'm talking about. Suppose in 1912, when the British attacked the United States of America, attacked Washington, D.C., burned down the White House, the President of the United States and his cabinet left town. Suppose, just suppose, the British took the city of Washington, D.C., and the President of the United States with his government fled the city to Chicago and they set up their system in Chicago. Does that mean the fall of Washington DC finished the government? There is no more United States of America? No. The system moved, just moved, changed its headquarters from one place to another. That's all. And it did. It happened, as a matter of fact, if you know any American history, you would know that, that the capital of the United States of America moved at least four times. From Philadelphia to New York, from New York to uh, Washington, D.C., and I forgot where it was before that, too. It moved from one place to another. And this is exactly what happened to the Roman Empire. The Bible said, this beast, dreadful, awful, frightening, this is different now. The Persian Empire wasn't Persian, it was destroyed and finished. The Grecian Empire was destroyed in Greece and was finished. The Babylonian Empire was destroyed in Babylon and was finished. But he said, that beast is different. That beast is different and would continue to go from the time Christianity is born until Christianity prevails at the time of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when Charlemagne was declared the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, the Roman system was revived in the West again and started to thrive. Then the system moved from France to Germany. You know, this is why they call the king in Germany, the what? Kaiser. It's the same word as Caesar. You know, even in English, it's very funny that the word Caesar, C-A-E-S-A-R. Did you know that? C-A in English should always be Ka. We'll let the Americans do whatever they want with their language. But instead of C-E-A, they put it C-A-E. And yet they pronounce Caesar, it should be pronounced Kaiser. The Germans pronounce it Kaiser, it means Caesar. Then the system moved to Russia, and the Russian called their king, what? The Tsar, which means 
Caesar. It's the same system. Moved from one place to another. It's a different kind of beast whose system would never be abolished from the face of the earth until the second coming. Now, if you study the Roman system in all these countries where it moved, France, Germany, Spain, and Russia, do you know the greatest persecutions of Jews during those centuries were under those kingdoms? Do you know the greatest persecution of Christians, born-again Christians, in the name of Christ now, under those systems? Under those systems. The inquisitions that were created under the system of the Holy Roman Empire was a vicious tool with two goals in sight to destroy the saints, the true believers in Christ in those days, and uh, force the Christians either to come back to the Holy Church of Rome or die, and also to give the Jews three choices, either to leave town or become a Christian Catholic or be killed. And they worked hard and long for centuries to reach those evil goals. As a matter of fact, the most infamous massacre that was committed by the help of the Inquisitions in France took place on the night of August 23-24 in 1572. They call that day Saint Bartholomew Day Massacre, wherein, because of that, 30,000 French Huguenots were massacred on that day simply because they were not of the nominal Holy Church at the time. As a matter of fact, in Spain and in Germany, the Jews were given uh, three choices, either to become Catholic under those systems, or you endure terrific persecution, or you move out. They had to move out from one place to another. And that is to fulfill the prophecy of God in accordance to Deuteronomy chapter 28, when he told them, when you forsake me, and I come to you, to his own, and his own accepted him and received him not, he said, when you forsake me, you are going to be scattered from one end of the earth even to the other. And even there, you will live in fear and you will grope in darkness as a blind man gropeth in darkness out of fear. Can you imagine what happened when the Nazi system, which is again a Roman system, it's a Roman system. Did you know that? Started to follow the Jews from one place to another. They had to flee at night and even early in the mornings and the days groping as if a blind man groping in darkness, hugging walls, being afraid to be seen by people. That was the Roman system. However, after World War II, the Roman system thought to be disappeared. How wrong people were. In 1948, six nations from Europe came together because after World War II, Europe was destroyed physically, morally, fiscally, economically, monetarily, you name it. It was totally destroyed and they needed to revive their kingdom. And they said, what are we going to do? Six nations came together. Italy, Germany, France, Luxembourg, Holland, and Belgium. Six nations. They said, we cannot live as parasites on welfare coming from the United States of America. We have to do something that would help our nation to stand up on its feet and become a rival to the United States economically. Okay, economists start to study from 1948 till 1958. On the 1st of January, 1958, under the auspices of the gold, they signed what we call officially the Treaty of Rome. They ratified the Treaty of Rome. And they became members of the economic, European economic community, commonly known as the common market. Now let me give you some, some things here very quickly. There were six nations. Then England said, we, I want to get in. De Gaulle at that time said no. You know, at that time I was studying at the law school in Lebanon, in the French law school. And de Gaulle was just a dictator in France, dictator in the common market, and he didn't like England at all. And when he said no, he meant it, and England had no chance to, of becoming a member in the common market. And I start, start to really wonder about this de Gaulle, especially when even my professors of law were just in love with de Gaulle and, and his power and his character. And I was at that time started to read my Bible concerning end time prophecies, and I said, boy, man alive, this is the beast, the Antichrist. But then after I start to form this idea that he's the Antichrist, you know, he resigned and he died, never rose again. He disappointed me. And 
he wasn't the Antichrist. Anyway, England came in, made the seventh nation. The prophet didn't know what he was talking about. If you read Daniel, you continue read Daniel in chapter 8, verse 27. He said, I saw all these visions and I wrote it down, but I couldn't understand them. And this is why I became sick to my stomach for several days. He got so mad because he couldn't understand anything of what he was writing. Read chapter 12. He started arguing with the angel of God concerning understanding the prophecies. What did the prophet of God, uh, the angel of God says? He said, Daniel, you shut up the words and seal up the, the book until the time of the end. It's not for you and none of your business to understand them. It's for the time of the end. Now, if we do understand them, not because we are wiser than Daniel, God forbid we aren't, we're getting dumber as the days go along, but because we have a 2020 hindsight that we can see a lot better right now because history is on our side, we can see things are being fulfilled before our very own eyes. And if we do see these things being fulfilled before our very own eyes, what kind of a life ought we have in these days, we who call ourselves born-again Christians? What kind of involvement in the spreading of God's words ought we be involved in these last days? Listen what Jesus Christ said. When you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your heads and look up. I am coming. And my friends, I really wish you come to the seminar because I'm going to share with you not one, not two, not three, not four, but literally dozens of verses about dozens of political events that are concurring all together right now before our very own eyes to tell us beyond any shadow of a doubt that we are the generation upon whom the ends of the ages are coming. And we are the ones that are privileged more than any generation that ever came upon this earth to have all these being fulfilled right before our very own eyes, telling us that one day the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain unto that day shall be changed in a twinkling of an eye and be caught up, snatched by the angel to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What does the Bible say? Scare each other with these words? No, sir. Comfort ye one another with these words. By necessity, I have to stop here. And I hope you listen to the completion of this message about how the Roman Empire was recreated in what we call today the European Union. What would be the future of the European Union under the conditions that the world will impose upon it? The Bible told us what's going to happen. And now every step that's being taken is towards the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Bible. And I hope you listen to it. It's the EU in prophecy. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for the comfort of Thy Holy Spirit. We thank You for the mystery of godliness, that You gave us that beautiful assurance that we are the children of God. Thank You for the Holy Spirit that's in us, that assures us of that great and mighty day when we are going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye to take off and meet the Lord in the air. Meet the one who loved us. Meet the one that we love even though we've never seen him. But we expect to see him one day face to face. What a glorious day. Lord, help us to live that kind of life of expectation so we can live the holy life that glorifies thy name in our midst of a crooked generation. And I pray, Lord, that you give everyone that listen to this message his spiritual needs, whether they're Christian, to rededicate their life for you and to live the life that would glorify thy name. And if it is someone has not been sure of his salvation, 
pray in Jesus' precious name that thy Holy Spirit would work in their hearts, that they may respond to thy calling and to accept you humbly as their personal Savior. In Jesus' precious name, amen.